So welcome to our Advances in Dementia Research webinar series that is presented to you by the Toronto Dementia Research Alliance in partnership with the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto. These webinar series occurs every two months and discusses recent updates in dementia research and highlights dementia research studies occurring across Toronto. For those of you who are not necessarily familiar with the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto provides information, education, and support to people living with dementia and their families and friends, healthcare professionals, and the general public within the M Postal Code. We service all dementias, and a diagnosis or referral is not required to access our programs and services. All of our programs and services are offered in a variety of formats from in-person to through Zoom, as well as the online education platform called ALS Educate. If you wish to learn more about what we have to offer each month, please do visit our website at www.alz.to and take a look at our calendar of events for upcoming offerings. I'd now like to introduce to you a little bit about our partner, the Toronto Dementia Research Alliance. Established in 2012, the Toronto Dementia Research Alliance, or the TDRA, is a collaboration among the University of Toronto, Baycrest, the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, Ontario Shores Centre for Mental Health Sciences, Sunnybrook, Unity Health Toronto, and the University Health Network. Together with its partners, the TDRA aims to strengthen the link between basic science and clinical research to better understand, prevent, and treat dementia. So I'd like to hand this off to Natalie Dren from the TDRN, TDRA to tell you a little bit more. Great, hey, thanks Julie. If we can move to the next slide. So TDRA partnered with AST on an initiative to try to make research more accessible to everyone. So the Toronto Dementia Network, or TDN, is a website that lists dementia-related programs and services across Toronto. And on this website, we created a section called Research Studies. And that section um, lists dementia studies that are open for participation across the city. Each study that is listed is led by one of our scientists, and it's been approved by a research ethics board. So on the site, there are studies for people living with Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia, mild cognitive impairments, those at risk of developing dementia, and healthy volunteers and caregivers, among some other groups. The studies are all summarized in plain language, and if you'd like to check it out, the website link is shown here on or um, in orange, and information about the TDN can also be found on the AST and TDRA website. Okay, next slide. And when you're on the website, there are two main pathways. First, you could browse for a study using search terms, filters, or quick searches. When you find a study that you might be interested in, you can fill out the contact form and you'll be connected with the research team and they'll be able to enroll you in the study if you're eligible. Or at the bottom here, if you're not sure where to start, you can fill out a questionnaire to be matched to a study and any information you enter will be securely stored and protected. Next slide. Okay, and this is what the website looks like when you're on the page. If you're looking for something specific, for example, Alzheimer's disease studies, you can type it into the search bar along the top and you can either hit submit with that term or apply more filters like the type of study, the age group, or the study location and then hit submit. Alternatively, you can use the quick search buttons we have in the blue boxes to make things a little easier. Or if you'd rather fill out a questionnaire to be matched to a study, you can click the match me to a study quick search box or scroll to the bottom of the page and you'll see this orange button that says can't find a study you're interested in. And that will also take you to the questionnaire to fill out. So each study summary describes what the study is about, who can participate, the location, and the time requirement, and that's all in plain language. So the study being discussed today will be listed on the TDN in the coming weeks, so you'll be able to read more about it there and connect to the study team if you haven't done it directly already. Okay, next slide. Great, so we're grateful to be joined today by 
Dr. Jennifer Rabin, who is a clinical neuropsychologist and scientist in the Herbert's Brain Sciences Research Program at the Sunnybrook Research Institute. She is also the neuropsychology lead for the Harcoil Center for Neuromodulation at Sunnybrook and an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. So welcome, Dr. Rabin, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you so much. I'm um, just going to share my slides. Okay, how's that? Great. Can see that. Okay. <clears throat> Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today and to tell you about risk and protective factors for Alzheimer's disease and dementia, and also about how your lifestyle can protect your brain. Alzheimer's disease remains one of the most feared consequences of aging. <clears throat> and I think that part of the fear around this devastating disease stems from the fact that it's often thought there's nothing we can do about it. Despite researchers knowing about the disease for more than a century, there are still no effective treatments to stop or prevent the disease. But what if I told you that I have a way for you to preserve your brain and your cognitive health into old age so that you can reduce your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and dementia? So today I'm gonna to tell you about this approach. And specifically, I'm gonna tell you how your lifestyle choices can impact your brain and cognitive health. But before delving into this topic, I first wanna give some background information on Alzheimer's disease and dementia, just to ensure that we're all on the same page. Often when I talk to people from the community, there's some confusion about the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia. I wanna just to take a minute to explain these terms. Dementia is an umbrella term used to describe a syndrome or a collection of symptoms. The dementia syndrome refers to a decline in thinking abilities or cognitive abilities that is severe enough to interfere with someone's day-to-day -day activities. And Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. So it's the disease that causes the dementia syndrome. And because it's the most common cause of dementia, it's likely why that it's so often confused with the term dementia. However, there's actually many causes of dementia, and I've listed a few here, though this list is certainly not exhaustive. Alzheimer's disease is defined by the abnormal buildup of two proteins in the brain. One is called amyloid or amyloid plaques, and the other is called tau or tau tingles. And so you can see these two proteins here in the brain of someone who passed away with Alzheimer's disease. And the buildup of these two proteins in the brain leads to the death of brain cells, which causes the brain to shrink and ultimately leads to problems with memory and thinking abilities. Now, while there's debate about the cause of Alzheimer's disease, most researchers believe that the disease unfolds in a very, very stereotypical way. So first, we start to see a accumulation of amyloid, one of those proteins I showed you on, on the previous slide. And the buildup of amyloid then leads to the accumulation of tau, that other uh, hallmark protein of Alzheimer's disease. And tau is very toxic to the brain and causes brain cells to die. This list leads to tissue loss throughout the brain, resulting in cognitive decline and eventually dementia. And today I'm gonna to talk about how our lifestyle choices can affect this chain of events. So the plot that you see here describes the trajectory of normal aging and Alzheimer's disease. So the solid black line over here represents the trajectory of normal aging and the dotted line here represents the trajectory of Alzheimer's disease. The first point I want to make is that Alzheimer's disease is not a normal or inevitable part of aging. In normal aging, thinking and memory skills decline slowly over time, as you can see here. However, these changes are not very severe, and they don't interfere with day-to-day -day activities. So you can all rest assured that some degree of forgetfulness is completely normal as we get older. So it's completely normal to have difficulty remembering the names of an acquaintance, or to forget a few details of a conversation you had with a friend or your doctor last week. 
However, it's not normal to have difficulty recalling the names of immediate family members or to completely forget that you went to the doctor or met up with a friend last week. So these are the kinds of memory difficulties we see in Alzheimer's disease. So we now know that amyloid and tau, those two hallmark proteins of Alzheimer's disease, begin to accumulate in the brain at least 15 to 20 years before an individual presents with dementia. So this means that by the time someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease by their physician, they've likely had the disease for more than a decade. And we know from other diseases like cancer and stroke that treatments uh, enacted early in the disease are the most effective. So we need to take the same approach in Alzheimer's disease. We need to intervene in the preclinical or the asymptomatic stage of the disease so that we can stop or slow the disease long before individuals have damage to their brains and problems with their thinking. But how do I we identify these asymptomatic individuals who are on the Alzheimer's disease trajectory? After all, they don't have any memory or thinking problems. In the last decade or so, several PET tracers were developed, which is an, PET tracers are an imaging technique that now allow for amyloid and tau to be visualized in the human brain. And the development of these neuroimaging tracers have really been a game changer for the field. And this is because we can now know whether someone has Alzheimer's pathology in their brain long before they start showing symptoms. So the images that I'm showing you here are images of amyloid PET scans. The image on the left is a healthy older adult who has no amyloid in their brain. And the image over here is a patient with Alzheimer's disease who has a head full of amyloid. And you can see that by the warm colors here. Now the image in the middle here is an older adult who has no memory symptoms, but who has elevated levels of amyloid in their brain. So you can see that the pattern of amyloid is somewhat similar to the patient who has Alzheimer's disease. And this is what we call preclinical Alzheimer's disease or asymptomatic Alzheimer's disease. When you have a, a head full of amyloid in your brain and yet you don't have any memory or clinical symptoms yet. And this is a stage of the disease that I'm very interested in. I also wanted to mention that researchers are getting closer to be able to detect amyloid and tau in, in the blood. And the hope is that in the near future, we'll have blood tests for Alzheimer's disease, but we're still a ways away from this. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what happens to someone's memory abilities or their thinking abilities if they have high levels of amyloid in their brain. Again, that very earliest stage of Alzheimer's disease. So these are data from the Harvard Aging Brain Study. This is an ongoing longitudinal study of healthy aging and preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So this is a study I worked on during my postdoctoral fellowship. So I wanna walk you through this plot. So on the x-axis here, I have time in years. So participants in this study were followed up to six years. And on the y-axis here, I have uh, a memory. Uh, I'm representing memory. And just to point out, a score of zero means that you have normal memory and, a, and, and uh, lower scores represent worse memory performance. Okay, this red line represents people who have a lot of amyloid in their brain, and this blue line represents people who have little amyloid in their brain. And what you can see here is that at the beginning of the study, both groups started off at zero, indicating that they had normal memory performance. But over time, we see decline in the, in the people who have a lot of amyloid in their brain and actually improve performance in, in people who don't have amyloid in their brain. And what we think is going on over here is a practice effect. So if you give healthy people the same test year after year, they're likely gonna get better on those tests. So now I'm showing you the same data, but I've divided the group into low amyloid and high amyloid, okay? And these lines look a little bit less steep than these lines here, just because I've extended this range. Okay, so what I wanna show you now are the individual data points. So these black lines represent the group averages and they're made up of these individual data points. So each of these lines represent an individual in the study and then the length of the line represents how long they've been followed in the study. So focusing on this high amyloid 
burden group. So that group who's in the earliest stage of Alzheimer's disease, but still clinically normal when they start in the study. You can see that the group declines, but actually when you look at the individual lines, some people's performance remains relatively stable and some people's performance actually improves. And this is really the crux of what I wanna understand. Why are some people more susceptible to the effects of amyloid than others? Or to flip this around, what are the factors that can prote protect us against further progression of Alzheimer's disease in individuals with elevated amyloid burden? So if you think back to that progression of Alzheimer's disease I showed you earlier, we wanna prevent patients from accelerating through this stage, these stages and stop the progression right at the elevated amyloid uh, stage. So we now know that lifestyle factors can influence the likelihood of developing dementia. And I'm curious whether people have any idea of what percentage of dementia cases can be attributed to lifestyle factors. So I don't know if everybody is muted and maybe we want to keep it that way. If anyone wants to take a guess or uh, maybe we can just all think of the answers to ourselves. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll provide the answer, but hopefully you've given, given it some thought. Um, so the answer is 40. So what this means is that 40% of dementia cases could potentially be prevented through lifestyle changes. And I think this is pretty amazing to think about that 40% of cases could be prevented based on people's lifestyle choices. So today I wanna to talk about the risk factors that can influence the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease. So what, what is a risk factor? A risk factor is something that increases your chances of developing a condition like Alzheimer's disease. And we know that there are many risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, and I've listed some of them here, but there are many others. So, um, there are some risk factors for Alzheimer's disease that we can't change. This includes our age and our genetics. So we've known for a long time that older age and certain genetic factors can increase the likelihood of developing dementia and Alzheimer's disease. However, I'm most interested in the risk factors that we can potentially change or control. And as you recently learned, learn 40% of dementia cases are linked to modifiable risk factors that we have the potential to change. So today in my talk, I'm gonna focus on some of those modifiable risk factors. Okay, I'm gonna start with vascular health. So vascular conditions refer to a group of conditions that affect the blood vessels, which are responsible for transporting blood throughout the body and also the brain. Vascular conditions include things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, diabetes, and smoking. And each of these conditions on their own can increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And when, and when they present together, they can actually increase risk in an exponential manner. So how do, how do vascular conditions lead to dementia? So the brain is outfitted with a rich supply of blood vessels, which are necessary for the delivery of oxygen and nutrients. And it's estimated that the adult human brain contains approximately 400 miles or 644 kilometers of blood vessels. And the further and deeper into the brain the blood vessels penetrate, the smaller they become. And these small blood vessels are incredibly vulnerable to vascular conditions. And with extended exposure to vascular conditions, these vessels can start to harden and thicken. This in turn can reduce blood flow to the brain causing brain cells to die, which in turn affects memory and thinking abilities. So in one of our studies, we wanted to examine the impact of poor vascular health on memory and thinking abilities in individuals who are in this earliest stage of Alzheimer's disease, okay? So individuals who have elevated amyloid in their brains, but again, who have no clinical symptoms. And specifically, we wanted to see whether poor vascular health speeds up the chain of events I showed you earlier. So these are also data from the Harvard Aging Brain Study, and I'm gonna walk you through these results. So again, on the x-axis, I have time in years, up to six years, 
And on the y-axis, I have a measure of cognition or a measure of thinking abilities, okay? The blue line represents participants who had good vascular health, and the red line represents people who had poor vascular health. So people with a lot of those vascular conditions I was telling you about, high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, and, and smoking. And what you can see from this plot is that, again, we see both groups start off at zero, indicating that they're normal when they enter the study in terms of their cognition. But over time, we see very steep decline in the individuals who have high amyloid and also poor vascular health, okay? And you see almost no decline in the group who has high amyloid, but good vascular health. And so what these findings suggest is that the presence of these uh, vascular conditions can accelerate cognitive decline and shorten the time it takes to go through those chain of events so that people reach the, the dementia stage faster. So the next thing we wanted to do in the study was to see whether any of the individual vascular conditions were driving the association with cognitive decline I showed you on the previous slide. And when we looked at this, we found that every single vascular condition we looked at predicted cognitive decline suggesting that even the presence of one of these conditions can have detrimental effects on our memory and thinking abilities. Now, the good news is, is that we know how to treat these conditions. We've actually known this for a really long time. So we know how to treat high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, diabetes, and we have effective strategies to help people quit smoking. So I've listed a few things here that you can do uh, to ensure that your vascular health is optimized. So one is keep up with routine doctor visits so that these conditions can be monitored on an on a ongoing basis. Also, if you've been prescribed medication for any of these conditions, these medications should be taken as directed. We find that people are prescribed these medications and are, are to take them on a daily basis, but patients don't often do that. We also recommend eating a healthy diet and exercising reg regularly since these lifestyle factors can reduce the likelihood of developing these conditions. And if you forget or can't remember um, the details of what I've shared today, a good rule of thumb is that whatever is good for the heart is good for the brain. Okay, I think the cardiologists have done a really good job at uh, how to have good heart health and heart health translates into good brain health. So again, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. The next risk, risk factor I wanna speak about is something called low cognitive reserve, okay? So cognitive reserve refers to your brain's ability to cope and keep working even in the face of damage from diseases like Alzheimer's disease, okay? And researchers think that engaging in mentally stimulating activities throughout your life can help build up high cognitive reserve. So let me introduce you to Sister Mary, who was enrolled in a study in 1986 that examined thinking abilities in a group of nuns. Nuns were chosen as subjects in the study because of their similar and relatively clean lifestyles, making it easier for researchers to isolate the factors that influence memory decline. So Sister Mary was passionate about education, and she continued teaching well after her official retirement at the age of 84. She was an avid reader, she was very social, and she remained heavily involved in community activities until she died. <clears throat> now, when Sister Mary passed at the age of 101, she had a brain autopsy, which showed advanced Alzheimer's disease. So her brain was filled with those plaques and tangles I showed you earlier. Now, at the time, this was very surprising to the researchers, because until the very end of Sister Mary's life, her scores on thinking and memory tests were better than those of adults 30 years younger. And she barely declined from her own scores in previous years. And so this study showed for the first time that engaging in mentally stimulating activities over the course of one's life can allow one to build up cognitive reserve, which can help protect the, the brain against diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And this phenomenon of cognitive reserve or engaging in mentally stimulating activities has now been replicated over and over and over again by researchers. So because of these findings, researchers now recommend keeping your mind active throughout your whole life 
and especially after you retire. It's not entirely clear which activities are most beneficial for the brain, so researchers recommend engaging in any challenging activity that you enjoy. So the reason researchers recommend engaging in activity you enjoy is because you're much more likely to do an activity than you, that you enjoy than one you don't enjoy, and then you're more likely to keep your brain active on a regular basis. So this can include anything from playing challenging games like bridge or chess, learning a new instrument or language, completing a crossword puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle, reading a book, or even socializing with family and friends. So again, it really doesn't matter what you do as long as you're challenging your brain. So the next risk factor I'm gonna speak about is physical inactivity. Several studies have now shown that regular physical activity or exercise can significantly reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So what we wanted to do is to build on these findings and investigate whether physical activity benefits older, our, older adults who already have some of those Alzheimer's changes in their brains. So specifically, we addressed this question in individuals with elevated amyloid in their brains. Okay, and this was determined by a, a, an imaging scan, a PET scan. So at the beginning of the study, we gave participants a pedometer um, that they could wear on their waist for seven days so that we could track how many steps they took each day. And this was our measure of physical activity, okay? And then every year we measured participants' memory and thinking abilities. And here's what we found. So again, hopefully you're getting used to looking at these plots. You can see again on the x-axis here, I have time and years. And this study was done a little bit later. So we have a bit more data on our participants, just over six years. And then we have memory performance on the y-axis, okay? The blue line represents participants who engaged in a lot of physical activity or, or took a lot of steps. And the red line represents participants who, who were quite sedentary, so took fewer steps. And so again, you can see at the beginning of the study, um, memory performance falls at a score of zero, which indicates that participants when they entered the study had normal memory and cognition. However, over time, we see a rapid decline in the participants who had high amyloid and low physical activity, and almost no decline in the group who had high amyloid, but engaged in physical activity, okay? So these findings suggest that physical activity can protect against Alzheimer's-related cognitive decline and delay the onset of dementia. So if you just look at the differences after six years of, of where these two, um, participant groups are, I think it's quite impressive. Where this group ends up is, is in the range of what we would classify as mild cognitive impairment, whereas the, the high physical activity group is largely still in the, the normal range uh, of memory abilities. So when it comes to physical activity, researchers recommend finding activities that you enjoy, again, because you're much more likely to stick with um, an exercise regime if you, if you enjoy it. So you might wanna opt for activities that you can do with other people. So things like walking or dancing. And we know that when you choose social activities, you're not only exercising your, your body, but also your mind, which we also know is good for brain health. And it's also a good way to encourage each other to exercise more often. So current guidelines suggest at least 150 minutes per week of physical activity. However, it's important to to remember that even shorter durations of physical activity can still be beneficial. In fact, researchers have shown that as little as 10 minutes of physical activity can have protective effects on overall health and on brain health. So things you can do are parking farther away um, from an entrance or taking the stairs instead of an up the elevator. So even simple things like that can help you get, get in your uh, 10 minutes of physical activity. So another risk factor I wanted to talk about is poor sleep. So I think all of us know that a bad night's sleep can impair our ability to think clearly the following day. However, research has also shown that getting too little sleep can increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And one important finding that's emerged in the literature is that sleep might be particularly important for clearing out harmful toxins from the brain. We think that when the brain is asleep, it's optimized for washing away harmful waste proteins 
that build up during the waking hours. So you can kind of think of it like a dishwasher that turns on at night. And one of the waste products that the sleeping brain clears is amyloid, that uh, early protein that builds up in the brain. Um, so again, here I'm showing amyloid, and that's what we want to uh, clear out. And again, if we're, if we're able to clear out this earliest protein, we might prevent these subsequent steps. So in one study, the, the authors examined the association between excessive daytime sleepiness and amyloid accumulation over time. And the authors found that participants who reported excessive daytime sleepiness, thought to be a marker of a lack of sleep, showed greater amyloid accumulation over a two-year period. So you can see here, we look, the researchers looked at different brain regions, and this is the change in amyloid over a two-year period. And the group with uh, excessive daytime sleepiness are those represented in these lighter gray boxes. And you can see that amyloid accumulation was faster in the group with daytime sleepiness compared to the group that didn't have daytime sleepiness. And so these findings support the idea that sleep might help clear amyloid from the brain and therefore reduce the risk of developing dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So just some tips in terms of, of good sleep hygiene. We know that going to bed at the same time each night and getting up at the same time each morning is really helpful for maintaining our circadian rhythms and getting a good night's sleep. Sleeping in a dark bedroom, a quiet bedroom, and one with a comfort, comfortable temperature can also promote sleep. We know that the blue light associated with electronic devices, so things like computers and TVs and smartphones, can interfere with our circadian rhythms. And so researchers recommend avoiding these devices for about two to three hours before going to sleep. And again, another benefit of physical activity is that it actually can reduce the time it takes to fall asleep at night. Okay, so the last risk factor I'm gonna speak about is hearing loss. So I really wanted to include this one here because I think this is one that many people don't know about. And in fact, we just learned about the connection between hearing loss and dementia in the last number of years. So recent studies, have, as I've just mentioned, have found a link between hearing loss and an increased risk of developing dementia. Hearing loss actually accounts for 9% of dementia cases. So this was the number one risk factor accounting for the greatest number of cases. Now, the exact mechanisms behind the connection between hearing loss and dementia are really not well understood, but there's, there's a few ideas. So one is that... Um, Hearing loss is tied to depression, and depression is another risk factor for, for Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Another idea is that hearing loss is tied to an increased risk of falling, and falling is another risk factor for dementia. Social isolation is also tied to hearing loss. We know that when people experiencing hearing loss, they tend to find it, they tend to be frustrated in social situations, and this can cause them to withdraw and become more socially isolated. And then another idea is that there's a common pathology or common abnormal protein that develops in the brain that causes both hearing loss and uh, dementia. So researchers are, are, are looking into this. So um, in terms of what we can do, one large longitudinal study found that dementia risk was not increased in people who wore hearing aids. And another study found that memory declined less after initiation of hearing aid use. So the recommendation is, is to go for hearing tests on a regular basis and um, especially go for hearing tests if you're having some difficulty hearing. Because we know the, the research is pointing to the, the idea that hearing aids may be able to offset um, the progression to dementia. So just to summarize those risk factors I've spoken about, there are many things we can do to preserve our brain and cognitive health and protect ourselves from dementia. I've mentioned a few of these in my talk so far. So they include managing vascular health, engaging in physical activity, keeping our minds active, getting a good night's sleep, and using hearing aids for hearing loss. So I wanted to spend the last bit of time just talking about some of our ongoing research projects. Canada is one of the most diverse countries in the world, 
And I, and I find it very surprising that uh, cognitive impairment and risk factors for cognitive impairment have mostly been studied in white samples in Canada and the US. And this gap in knowledge is quite problematic because the limited prior work in this area suggests that some non-white ethno-racial uh, ethno groups may be at higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. So there are data from the US suggesting that uh, African-Americans are twice as likely than white populations to have Alzheimer's disease and Latino or Hispanic Americans are about one and a half times as likely. The reason for the higher rates of Alzheimer's disease among these groups remain unclear, but may relate to differences in risk factors. That's what researchers are thinking. So you can see here um, that uh, relative to white populations, African American and Latino Americans are, most, are more likely to experience vascular conditions. So things like strokes, obesity, heart disease, high blood pressure, and diabetes. And as, if you, as uh, you've all learned today, all of these conditions are also risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. While individuals who self-identify as Black or Hispanic form a large part of the United States population, in Canada, the largest non-white ethnic groups include individuals of South Asian descent, and individuals of East Asian or Chinese descent. And despite these groups being among the largest and fastest growing ethnic groups in Canada, they are significantly underrepresented in Alzheimer's research. Now, interestingly, we know that there are differences in the vascular profiles of these two understudied groups. So relative to white individuals, South Asian Canadians have a higher prevalence of heart disease, stroke, a greater burden of vascular risk factors, so things like diabetes and hypertension, high cholesterol, and also visceral fat, so um, fat around the abdomen area. And in contrast, East Asian Canadians have a lower burden of vascular risk factors compared to white individuals. However, they are at higher risk of hemorrhage or bleeds in the brain, and they're also more susceptible to higher blood pressure. However, when I went to literature to see whether um, these risk factors translate into higher rates of Alzheimer's disease and dementia, there were no statistics. And that was really surprising to me, especially given the amount of data we have on non-white ethnic groups in the United States. And so this led us to launch the CAMERA study, which stands for Canadian Multi-Ethnic Research on Aging. Okay, and this study is carried out in collaboration with Maged Gubron, who's an imaging scientist at Sunnybrook, and also Sandra Black, a world-renowned neurologist also at Sunnybrook. And the aim of the study is to better understand aging and risk factors for Alzheimer's disease through an inclusive lens that captures Canadians from different backgrounds, particularly those that have been understudied. So for the study, we're recruiting 100 East Asian, and Chinese individuals, 100 South Asian individuals, and 100 white individuals. We're looking for participants who are between the ages of 55 and 85 who don't have significant memory problems. So again, that we can study that very early, the very earliest changes in memory and thinking abilities. Now, one of our criteria um, is that participants must be sufficiently fluent in English and this is for consent purposes, so consenting to the study procedures and also understanding test instructions. The hope is that as uh, we move further in this study, we'll be able to do some of the testing in other language to accommodate more people. Um, and then participants in the study will be followed for five years. And this is really important because that's how we get our best data, by following people over time and seeing what happens over a period of time, as opposed to just bringing people in on a single occasion. So this is what our study looks like. So people are followed over five years. In the first year, participants come in for two in-person visits at Sunnybrook. And then in year two, we do some remote questionnaires. In year three, we repeat what was done at year one. Year four, again, we're doing remote testing, um, just some questionnaires. And in year five, we're again repeating what we did in year in year one. And so really this only involves coming in in three separate, separate years for a total of six visits over the five years. 
So in this study, we're asking participants to um, undergo the following. So a brain MRI, and this will allow us to look at some of the very earliest brain changes that occur. We're hoping to take blood in all participants so that we can look at uh, changes in vascular profiles, so things like cholesterol, and also look at those Alzheimer's proteins in the blood that are now just um, gaining traction in the research community. We're, we're gonna look at blood pressure and weight and also give participants a watch like this so that we can track their sleep and physical activity. Participants will do a hearing test because as, as you've learned today, hearing is a significant risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Participants will complete a number of memory and thinking tasks. And then we have a lot of questionnaires so that we can better understand participants' backgrounds, um, gain information on risk factors, their, their lifestyle choices, and so on. So um, in terms of our participants, um, we launched the study about a year ago. And to date, we've uh, recruited 31 individuals who identify as East Asian, 22 who identify as South Asian, and 15 who identify as white for a total of 68 out of our 300. Um, so we're definitely making progress, but we're, we're looking for more participants. So what, what are the benefits of participating? So given the time, I, I'm gonna go over this um, somewhat quickly, um, but one of the main reasons is to advance scientific knowledge. We can't learn about Alzheimer's disease, dementia, early changes in healthy people unless we study um, these changes and people come in to be participants. Another benefit is regular health monitoring. So because our participants undergo brain scans, um, blood results and cognitive testing, we review all of these results. And if there's anything um, that looks out of the ordinary, we contact participants. So we have a neuroradiologist who reviews all the MRIs. And if there's something concerning found, we let participants know. Also, if participants wanna be informed that nothing was found, we can let them know that, which can be very reassuring. We have a study nurse on our, on our study. So if participants wanna talk through their blood work, they can speak with our study nurse. She can make recommendations about medications and, and um, high blood pressure. We communicate um, with family physicians. We're happy to send blood results to family physicians as well as to participants. And then finally, the cognitive results. So we review everything. And if there's any concern that participants are not falling in the normal range as they should, we, uh, with permission, we will send the results to a family physician and in all of these cases, if abnormal results are found, we really try to expedite referrals to specialists at Sunnybrook. So in some ways, we're making our participants healthier. You can also, in this study, you can help contribute to personalized medicine. So we are learning that certain genetic factors, that um, certain ethnic backgrounds, that certain lifestyle choices can all affect the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And unless we study this, we won't know what types of interventions different people will benefit from. Hopefully participants find some personal fulfillment in participating and helping us further science. And then also we offer financial compensation for the study, um, about $50 per, per session, in-person session. Um, and we also cover the cost of parking and snacks. So we provide snack vouchers um, to use at Sunnybrook because we don't want to incur any cost to our participants. So if you're interested in learning more about the study, feel free to email us at this email address. You can also learn about our study at this website here. Um, and um, maybe I'll just leave this up for a second in case anyone wants to jot that down. Um, maybe we could also send it out uh, in case people are interested because it's not yet up on the um, Toronto Dementia Network website yet. And then with that, I just want to thank you all for listening and for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. And here's my personal email address if you'd like to email me and ask any questions um, that don't get answered today. So thank you very much.